So welcome to today's lesson uh, as we continue to look at the uh, effect that Sport England has on um, uh, grassroots sport in the UK. Uh, our normal lesson obje uh, learning objectives uh, shown here, because you can see exactly the same as we've had for the last two or three lessons. Um, but our big question in today's lesson is based here at the bottom of the screen is how does Sport England work with their local and national partners to try to increase participation in sport and physical activity for underrepresented groups here in the UK? Now, um, we're continuing to look at this idea of the interrelationship between Sport England and its national and local uh, level partners. And I thought today we'd start looking at this uh, particular diagram of, of what the structure of UK sport looks like. Now, we've, we've discovered in previous lessons that um, uh, we've got this particular body in the government, which is called the, De the Department for Culture, Media and Sport, which is a group of people who are actually in charge of uh, running sport here in the UK. Um, and we've also talked about the, the fact that grassroots sport is based on this pyramid of participation. And we talked about the foundation of that pyramid being uh, school sport. Now, it's interesting to note here, if we look at this diagram over on this side, and you should be able to see my cursor moving now, we've got the DCMS, the Department for Culture, Media and Sport, and they directly run, directly fund sport in the UK. But on the other side of the uh, diagram, on this side here, we've got the DFES, which is the Department for Education. Now, the DFES directly funds school sport. But that's not to say that the Department for Culture, Media and Sport doesn't have an impact there as well. Um, school sporting facilities can often be paid for via the DCMS, via Sport England and various different programmes that are in place. Sometimes the funding can come from UK sport. We go on to look at UK sport next year uh, in year 13 and when we actually look at elite level sport within the UK. But um, Sport England will actually, through the various different programmes that it runs, and remember we've got localised programmes, which are the active programmes, such as Active Sussex, Active Hampshire, Active Surrey, um, and um, they will uh, enable funding to become available for either clubs to be run or sometimes that funding can come in the way of uh, expertise through coaching sometimes it can come through direct funding for facilities so if you've ever um, wandered around a sports facilities here at Luffy you'll notice that the Mooga the multi-usage games area outside there's a little plaque up on the, uh, the the fence as you go in saying funded by Sport England so Sport England place some funding in for that particular facility to be built so Remember, national level, two different bodies within the government, uh, Department for Culture, Media and Sport, DCMS, is who is responsible for running sport here in the UK. Sport is split into two bodies, UK sport, which is the elite level sport. We don't worry about that this year. What we're interested in is Sport England, which is grassroots sport. On the other side of the equation, we've got the DFES. DFES in charge of um, schools. Uh, and particularly school sport. We know that school sport is really, really important because it's the base level of the participation pyramid and um, school sport can also receive some sort of financial support or funding which can, can come through Sport England via the Department for Media, Culture and Sport. So two weeks ago, we um, looked at this idea of the Child Protection Unit in sport and how they worked particularly with youth level sport. Now that became important when we were talking about the Department for Culture, Media and Sport uh, and school sport in particular, or youth sport. Uh, your homework from the last lesson was to, to research two other particular groups of people. And the two groups of people that you were asked to go away and find out about was the, the Chance to Shine, or in fact the Cricket Foundation, which, which changed its name, it's more widely known now as the Chance to Shine Academy. Uh, which, which tries to promote um, participation in grassroots sports via cricket as a sport. And the second sport that you were asked to go away and research was the Football Foundation. Now, I'm just going to ask you now just to show me on camera um, the uh, work that you've done on research for that. So uh, I'll go round one by one and ask you all to show me uh, the work that you've done on that. 
Excellent. Well done. That's great. So um, your homework for today, and we will come back onto this later on as well, but your homework for today is actually to, to look at two other national partners for Sport England. And the two national partners that I'd like you to look at today are the Activity Alliance, um, which were formerly known as the English Federation of Disability Sport and Sporting Equals. So that's the Activity Alliance and Sporting Equals, exactly the same as our previous homeworks. I want to know who they are, what they do, who do they impact on. So you're going to find out about specific programmes with those two national partners. So we've, we've been learning about the different groups of people within the UK who the government will target for under-participation. And we looked specifically at the Sport England survey and the DCMS surveys. And um, the, these particular groups of people the government will target with what we call an inclusive programme, this idea that we want to include everyone as much as possible. So our AO1 definition of the word inclusiveness is to include people of all kinds within an activity or a group. So if we, we consider, say, for example, uh, disability, which is one of the groups that you've been asked to go away and look at this week. Disability in sport, there, there's a specific uh, sport that has been uh, developed, which is called boccia. Now, boccia is uh, an activity which is a, a target game. The idea is to get your your particular balls cl closest to the target in order to score points. And uh, we've actually got a boccia link with the uh, Paralympic squad here in Mr. Saunders, uh, who's head of sit form. His son is in the um, GB team for boccia and was in scheduled to go to the next Olympic Games, uh, which we know sadly is be moved for next year, but he will be on that plane to Japan uh, in order to take part in that, that particular sport. Um, another key phrase for us is this key phrase, barrier to participation. And, and barrier to participation is this idea that there's an obstacle that's put in our way, um, either by ourselves or by other people, which can act as a deterrent to participation. Now, it's really important to, to, to recognize that the barriers are not just physical barriers that are placed in front of us. Sometimes those barriers can be uh, placed in by, by our own views uh, on particular issues, by our, our um, upbringing, by our culture, um, by uh, our religious beliefs and the clothing that we have to wear. Uh, and, and so um, it's important that when we're thinking about barriers, we, do, we don't just think about, oh, well, the barrier for a disabled person is about um, accessibility and about the fact they've not got enough ramps or they've not got enough access into the building. It's not just that. Sometimes it can be a, a psychological barrier. I don't want to be bullied. I don't want to look stupid in front of other people. So we need to think about that really, really carefully when we're defining what a barrier to participation is. And we're also defining this idea of inclusiveness within sport. So discrimination. Um, now, there, there's some key phrases that we need to be aware of here. And, and over the course of this topic, there's loads of these little key phrases, AO1 definitions that we need to be aware of. So, so discrimination is this, uh, this idea that there is um, some sort of unfair treatment taking place to a particular person because of a stereotype or a prejudice loads of key words here. Now I'm going to actually start, I'm not going to start with our definition of the word discrimination because you, you'll notice as you look at the, the distinction I put, or the definition I put in front of you now that the, um, the word discrimination uses these two key phrases prejudice and stereotype. So let's start with this word stereotype. It's at the bottom of the screen here just where my cursor is. So a stereotype is a, a, a very, very simplified view of something. Where does that stereotype come from? That stereotype could come from our primary socialization. So the, uh, the issues or the background that our parents bring us up with when we first start to learn to socialize with others are gonna be firmly imprinted upon us. So, um, Typical types of stereotypes that you might be given based on where you grow up in the country could be about uh, supporting particular uh, political parties. 
Um, so we know that the country seems to be very, very split uh, in terms of its political map or has been in the past between North and South. So we would say, well, Northerners, they, they follow the Labour Party and Southerners, they follow the Conservative Party. That's like a stereotype, isn't it? It's me grouping loads and loads of people together based on a, a, a very simplified view that I have of a particular political map of the country. And, and, and often the stereotypes that we have are, are incorrect or, or have only partial truth in them. Uh, and we might twist them and move them. So, so we've got to be really careful about this, this phrase stereotyping. The bad, the bad part of this is what we would call prejudice. Now, prejudice can be based on a stereotype. Prejudice is where we, we ha have a, or make a judgment on someone or have an opinion of someone which are often based on irrational, incomplete or inaccurate stereotypical views. So that's really, really important. I, I'm gonna, I have a prejudice against young people because they're all thugs, they're all hooligans. Anyone that wears a hoodie must be a young thug. They must be out there to try and uh, cause trouble in the community. It would be a prejudicial view, wouldn't it, towards someone wearing a hoodie. Uh, and, and so this word prejudice, I would say, is, quite, is a very negative word. Stereotyping is perhaps a, an ill-informed uh, view of something, but prejudice tends to be far more uh, irrational uh, and far more negative in its connotation. Then we, then we come to this definition of the word discrimination. Now, discrimination comes far, it becomes far more important within our society. So let's actually think about groups of people who have maybe been discriminated against in society. Um, and we've actually got over, over this half term holiday, we've got a particular political issue that's taken place in the United States of America. And we, we have seen a black man who has been arrested by the police to some extent resisted arrest by the police. And we've seen three police officers pin him to the floor, uh, three white police officers pin him to the floor with one of them having his knee on the back of that particular um, uh, perpetrator's neck and, and they've actually ended up killing him. Um, and we maybe say that that's, that is discrimination it's discrimination against that black person. It's a, a discrimination against where that person has come from and their particular views to something. And it's treating someone very differently. Now, I, I, it's interesting, I saw this picture on Twitter, or it might be Facebook yesterday, of a, a, a white girl who grew up in a very affluent area of LA who went to a school prom with, a, with a, an M16 assault rifle on her back. And um, she was just asked by the principal to, to go and lock that away. And it, it was absolutely fine. And yet we could be in a situation where a young black person could, could take a water pistol to school and could be shot for what's going on. Uh, and this idea of discrimination is, is something that, that particularly in terms of racial connotations is something that we need to be aware of. Discrimination takes place within our society, within disability sport as well. Um, my sister has Down syndrome, so I've always been very, very aware of the issues with Down syndrome. But but one thing that, that amazes me over time is we, in and around the changing rooms is you can hear various different people refer to issues to do with disability in the changing rooms. And on one of the, the favourites, um, one of the favourite insults that's thrown around is, oh, you're downsy, or you've got downs, um, based on someone's physical looks or the way that someone responds to someone. Now, that, that, is, that is discrimination. That's treating people differently through a prejudice or an unfair treatment of one person. Discrimination, I would say, is very closely linked to bullying. Um, and um, bullying can either be physical or mental. And that's something that we really need to try and tackle within our community. And the government is very, very aware of, which is why it pumps so much money into these national partners of Sport England to try to tackle discrimination, prejudice and stereotypical views. 
So what are the key areas of prejudice that we might come across? Well, the key areas that we've looked at are ethnicity, gender, disability, and we've also looked at socio-cultural background. So that might be low income or demographic um, uh, part of society, where we live, where we come from. We've also touched on the last few weeks this idea of youth and age, um, and the government is, in, in, is um, interested in this, and they will try and tackle this idea of discrimination by youth and age. But that tends to be more from a, DFS, a DFES point of view and school sport. We, we've got this participation pyramid, which is massive at the bottom. So we, it, we perhaps need to put more funding into these other areas. We know that everyone takes part in sport at a young age. That's fine. It's keeping them win, within sport. And this age bracket, 14 to 25 or 14 to 26, becomes really, really important to the government. How do we keep youngsters in sport? That's, a, that's an area that they look at now. The, the massive areas in terms of where there's a drop off is about ethnicity, is about male versus female, is disability, and is about socioeconomic background. So let's just have a look at some of the facts and figures from uh, a Sport England survey. Um, sports participation and ethnicity in England. This was a survey taken in 1999 to 2000. Overall participation amongst ethnic minorities was 40% rather than 46%. Well, straight away, I'm looking at these two figures and I'm thinking, oh, well, this is not a Sport England survey. This is a DCMS survey. To see those numbers are much, much higher than those Sport England ones that we looked at. All groups were lower than the national average, apart from black other, who had 60% participation. That's interesting. So we, we, we quite often group people from ethnic minorities. We would say uh, black Caribbean. Um, we would maybe say black Asian from a, a particular point of view. But, but the, the black others, what group of people is that within our society? Is that black British? Is that people who have been through the generations, so haven't just come into the country in the last 20, 30, 40 years, but it's actually generation upon generation where the participation rate is really, really high. Um, most of the reasons for these changes in participation were to do with work, to do with uh, educational studies, or to do with home, uh, what goes on in the home, or to do with families and the, the uh, particular um, uh, beliefs that a family has, was to do with money or was attributed to laziness. But some people also quoted the fact that they had a negative experience of taking part in sport due to their ethnicity. Um, we're going to look at some of the, the issues that come across um, ethnicity within sport over, over the next few minutes or so. Right, so quick exam question for you. Suggest reasons why various sporting activities have a higher participation rate by certain ethnic minority groups. This is a four mark question. So A01, I would suggest to you in this particular question, is worth one or two marks. So you're looking for, for one or two reasons why sporting activities or particular sporting activities have a higher participation rate than another. So it's a comparative like question. So we're going to think of two different sporting activities. Where are the numbers high? Where are they low? What is the reason for that? And then your, your AO2 is your reasoning or your explanation as to why they might be the case. So this is worth four marks. So four marks is four minutes on the exam. Have a go at answering that question now. So let's have a look at some potential answers on this one. And you, you green pen your answer as, as we go through this now. Um, if I say something different to what you've got down, then, then note that down alongside what's going on. So let's have a look at an activity where percentage participation amongst particular ethnic groups is really, really high. Football. Now, football. Black footballers. There is a huge issue with black managers or people from a BAME 
um, background being low in participation when it comes to managerial level. But in terms of players, we will start, we will find that there is a high percentage of um, ethnic minority group participation within this sport of football. Why is that? Well, one of the things that's increasingly become a reason at why the numbers are high could be role models. How many role models do we see out there, good role models that are out there that people really want to, to see in, in the public light as much as possible? One that springs to mind straight away, who, who's um, very, very forthright with his views and, and has had both positive experiences and negative experiences is Raheem Sterling. So Raheem Sterling, obviously, in Man City uh, and England, um, he uh, is very forthright in the fact that he was brought up or he grew up within sight of Wembley Stadium. Very, very poor background. I, I believe he came from a single parent background um, and uh, grew up in amongst the gangs in the, in the particular part of London where he um, was associated with, but he managed to find his way out of there. He's seen as a potential huge success within football and someone who other people from those types of backgrounds would want to aspire to be like, to aspire to achieve the same levels of skill that he has to uh, achieve, to uh, aspire to the same level of financial reward that he's gained and to some extent to some extent, and we need to be a little bit careful with this because he does sometimes do things that can be seen in a negative light as well. Um, to some extent, the the positive view that he will bring across uh, and the positive uh, life message that he will bring across to others. Let's not forget there are sometimes negative issues associated with him. So perhaps one of the ones that comes to mind in the last two years is the fact that he had a, 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 um, an assault rifle tattoo printed on his calf. And it was the message that that was sending out there. But how many black swimmers do we see? So if we were to look at the black Olympic team, how many black role models are there? I would really struggle to name any, any major sports personality, black major swimmer. And, and that's something that then starts to create a vicious cycle because then do we have anyone to aspire to be like in the swimming world? Um, do we have anyone who, who other young black swimmers would want to be like? Perhaps we'll be lucky and perhaps we'll get someone that comes along who happens to be the next superstar, who happens to be black. And suddenly we get this influx of uh, of people from an Afro-Caribbean background um, taking part in the sport of swimming. A stereotypical view, so bringing in this idea of prejudice and discrimination here, a stereotypical view might be, well, black people have more muscle mass and therefore they sink within swimming in swimming as a sport that that's not true that's simply not not physiologically true whatsoever but it is this it is this stereotype that some people would have um, within that particular group so participation levels in swimming are really really low participations in football are really really high bodybuilding participation amongst ethnic minority groups is really high in bodybuilding why is that I, I, again, what, I don't know of a major sporting personality who perhaps um, I could name as someone that people would aspire to be like. But I can think of the fact that uh, people who come from ethnic minority backgrounds um, perhaps have a perhaps, and this could be a stereotypical view, a, a, a more muscular frame, uh, a more uh, mesomorphic body type uh, and uh, Therefore, this idea of this is the perfect body, this is what I want to look at, look at my six pack, my eight pack, my 10 pack, my 12 pack, um, it is more muscular and more powerful. And that's something that that particular group of people might aspire to, uh, to look like. Sport of athletics, if we look at how particular groups have developed in the sport of athletics. There is this, there is this idea that um, that 
groups of sprinters and groups of long distance runners all um, were associated with two particular uh, African tribes. And I think you'll find that long distance running is supposed to have come out of a small East African uh, village, whereas sprinting comes from a, a small West African village uh, and very much body type. And we've, we've seen the Kenyans and the Ethiopians um, and, and in more recent times, Eritrea seems to be a country that's coming to the forefront for participation within within running as a way of getting out of a particular um, uh, a particular background or a particular way of life. So we've seen athletics as an escape from a lifestyle uh, and a way of a way of um, going from rags to riches. So the participation level in athletics has massively gone up. How how many times can you think that you might have looked at um, you might have looked at someone and, 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 and maybe uttered the words or heard the words uttered? Well, they're black. They're going to be quick, aren't they? I've heard it so many times as a PE teacher listening to conversations. Another sport where we would associate with an ethnic minority uh, in terms of um, participation is, is badminton, and badminton particularly with the Asian race. So if we look at badminton as a sport and we think about it as an Olympic sport, many, many, many Olympic titles have been won by the Chinese or uh, from China, Chinese Taipei or Taiwan or, or even Japan as a nation. Uh, and badminton is a sport that we very much might associate or traditionally associate with that particular Asian background. But, and table tennis is another one that springs to mind. And they're very, very popular. And success breeds success. And this idea that, that if a particular nation or a particular country or a particular ethnic background do well at sport, then lots and lots of people will cotton on. And, and really that widens your participation pyramid. And as your participation pyramid widens, the chances are that more people are going to start to come to the top of that participation pyramid and be elite level performers. So it's really, really helpful to have that big wide base. And it's actually helpful to different nations in the world to actually have sports that they specialize in or people associate them with specializing in because you're more likely to have success. Let's think about the Indian subcontinent. Let's think about India. Let's think about Sri Lanka. Two particular countries who would say that their national sport is cricket. Uh, and we've we've seen for many years now that this this idea that India is perhaps the number one um, test playing nation in the world between India and Australia. The Australians have a strong claim to this as well. But uh, in terms of participation rate and having that baseline participation rate, cricket is very much a sport that the Indians have taken to heart and, and use. And the participation level in India is really, really high. Why is it not so high in the United States? Why is it that the US, who claim to be world champions in just about every sport, why, why is cricket not really cottoned on there? And, and ask yourself that question. So those were some of the answers that I think you could, you could have chosen to go down, you could have chosen to have a look at um, to that particular question. So why is ethnicity such a complex issue within sport? Well, ethnic minorities, Cat will try to avoid potential clashes, will try to avoid potential prejudice. In fact, that's a stereotypical view straight away, isn't it? I, I think as human beings, we would try to avoid um, situations where we could be seen to be prejudiced or, or have prejudicial views towards something. So, so um, that's something to bear in mind. Uh, there is a higher average percentage of people from ethnic minorities in economically deprived areas. Particularly if we look here in the UK, if we look at inner city areas now, the inner cities tend to be tend um, very much populated by those people who have come from minority backgrounds. So um, if we look at perhaps the, the Midlands as an area, you would tend to find in the Midlands people from Asian descent um, filling some of the major cities there um, in and around perhaps Birmingham and Leicester uh, and Derby and Nottingham. Um, if we were to perhaps think further down south, 
Um, again, you've got big Asian communities in London, but I, I think particularly of London and I think particularly of places like Bristol uh, of having quite big black communities as well and African Caribbean communities. And that came about through um, different groups, and different backgrounds of people moving to this country um, at different times in the 20th century and actually setting up home in, in this country. Um, cultural values may be very, very different um, to those um, of, of perhaps the white British um, nation. And um, cultural values will often revolve around things like education or um, taking part in particular activities. So um, Asians, for example, people from Asian backgrounds would place a very, very high value on educational success. And, and I don't think, I don't believe it's any um, coincidence that if you are to look at any of these uh, shows that are cropping up now, like, oh, are you smarter than a 10 year old? Or um, if we look at spelling bees and contests that go around that, that actually a lot of those youngsters that you will see at a very, very, very young age doing particularly well, um, tend to come from minority backgrounds. Um, we've got to bear in mind the traditional views of women in some of these groups as well. So um, women in particular can be from backgrounds. So I just want to share with you this video here, which is from Sporting Equals, which is one of the groups that you're going around to uh, research today. So I'll let that one um, carry on, and I'll let you watch that in your own time now. That so I'll leave you with this um, particular fact here. So think back to 2007. Thirty percent of the world championship team that went to the world championships for athletics was from a black Caribbean or black African background, and thirty percent of the England football squad are also from the above communities. And I want you to go away from here, and I want you to ask yourself. Why is that? Why do those particular sports do well from those particular communities? Now, your homework, as we stated earlier on in the lesson, was to go and uh, research two particular groups um, of individuals within sport uh, and two particular groups. So the two groups are to go and research who, what and who do they affect uh, the activity alliance are associated with. And then the same thing with sporting equals. And you've got a little bit of a clue that, that I gave you in as much as I showed you a video a few minutes ago. Uh, and those particular national partners and how they work with Sport England is really, really important. I shall see you again on Friday.